everybody. Do you want to know all about fairy ferments? Do you want to learn how to make your own hot sauce? Do you want to know the secret of fermenting your own fruits and vegetables right here in the middle of summer? Well, of course you do. Hey, y'all, welcome to Cookbooks with Virginia. My name is Virginia Willis. I'm a chef and cookbook author in Atlanta, Georgia. And every Friday at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I have Cookbooks with Virginia. And I am so excited today. Um, we've got Fury Ferments and it's Kirsten Shockey and she's got a company called Ferment Works and I am a huge fan I have loved um, working with more fermented things. It's good for our bodies. It's good for your gut. It's good for your immune system, like all this stuff. And I love making pickles and preserves. And so expanding this part of my repertoire has been great. So let's bring her on and say, hey. Hi there. Good Thank morning. you so much. Yeah, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So let me tell everybody too. So y'all go to my Instagram page. So this is like a multi multi component. So you're going to go to my Instagram page. You're going to look for the copy of this book. You're going to follow me. You're going to follow Ferment Works and you are going to enter to win a copy of this beautiful book by Story Publishing. So Kirsten, you've been a guest on before and I couldn't, I was so excited to ask you to come back again. Yeah. I was excited to come back. I think we yeah. had also some streaming issues, which we aren't having this morning. I yeah, really knock on wood, knock on wood. So, so get, let's get, let's get things started. And um, please tell us, tell folks a little bit about what you do and the, the school and your cookbooks. And you were just, you were like the premier expert on fermentation and canning. I just want you to tell people all about us. Yeah. So um, I, live on 40 acres in Southern Oregon and um, moved here 23 years ago. Jeez, that's a big number. <laughs> and uh, started a garden and there was old apple trees that came with the property. And uh, it was really pulled into preservation. And so that became um, all forms of preservation. And, you know, of course I started with canning and we had um, dairy animals, so cheese making was a was a big thing. Cider making with all those apples, and at one point I really dug into fermenting vegetables because I realized that to preserve my garden bounty, um, that was the best way because I'm leveling up the nutrition instead of instead of killing things like it's there's more vitamin C, there's vitamin K two, there's B twelve and it's all more bioavailable. So I'm taking these vegetables at the peak of their, um, you know, their nutritional value, their freshness, yes. their flavor, you know, and, and especially that flavor piece, right. And, and preserving them in a way that, that it keeps that integrity and also makes it better. No, sure. So let me ask you, did you grow up with this or is this something that you were, did you have in your family or did you teach yourself? Like, I feel like, I mean, obviously fermentation has been around for millennia, right? Centuries. I mean, that's originally like original preservation, but I think we kind of got away from it. Right. But there has been this huge resurgence, I think. Thanks yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So no, I didn't grow up with this at all. I'm, uh, my dad was an anthropologist professor, so we lived all over the place. We certainly did not dig in the ground and feel grounded and connected in any one community or place. Wow. Um, That's a whole other show. show. <laughs> um, I, did, um, I did have us, you know, it's, it's exactly right. You know, it, it became education really quickly. I had a small business because I'm like, oh, this is fun. This is tasty. You know, people should be eating these foods. And that was a number of years ago before fermentation had any kind of hip unless you were wine or beer or right right well that probably that probably started the trend right like people make you know the bros making beer in their garage you know i've got a neighbor it, bro it probably did and it just has moved along and and so i was teaching people at the market to ferment foods and and i realized i enjoyed that 
uh, much more than you know, like making the same recipe over and over, and over again. I loved making recipes. I loved sharing, but I didn't love standing at the market always having the same same thing. And that grew into books. And the books then with the pandemic, um, well, as an author, um, you have to teach or do some yeah. other thing to help out. You. Yeah, I get the word out. And so um, when the pandemic struck, all, my te all the traveling teaching I did um, went away. Atlanta was actually one of my last trips. <laughs> wow, that was before we knew you. When you come back, you yeah. can stay with me. I'd love that. It'd be awesome. That'd be fun. Yeah, and so then um, the pandemic pivot was to start a fermentation school, um, and it's called the Fermentation School. And it became a startup with a good friend of mine, um, Meredith Lee, who lives in North Carolina. And it's all about uh, teaching fermentation. And we're finding women teachers from all over the world to start populating the site with more classes than just ours. Oh, it's just so cool. I just think it's like so amazing. And, um, and you know, there have been, there've been so many terrible things, obviously, about the pandemic. But I think that one of the really wonderful things is to find beauty where there isn't any, right? Like to, and so, I mean, I know that with some of my business, I had opportunity that I would not have had in, in normal time, right? And, and, and so much of this, like this very show that we're doing right now, this is like really taken off. And I think that part of that has to do with like people spending more time online and trying to have a connection. Um, and we can, right? It's a little bit different, right? So, well, talk to me about fairy ferments because you definitely got like some population here. You got the people that love to make hot sauce, which is, you know, a whole thing, right? And then you've got, uh, you've got fermentation heads, you know, like things like that. So, so, um, but these, y'all, Thai peppermint cilantro paste, ginger pickles, Jamaican jerk sauce, lemon achar. Uh, kumquat chutney, Caribbean salsa, stuffed pickle, cherry bomb peppers, sriracha, uh, Korean chili paste, green peppercorn mustard. I mean, yum. Yeah, you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. So where do you get your inspiration for this? Where do you, you know, um, where do you get your inspiration for the different hot sauces? Yeah, so this book was really fun in a lot of ways because it sort of a condiment cookbook and, and yes uh -huh. it's based on heat but kind of the cool thing is that it really is a condiment cookbook and all throughout the book it's like you know what you don't like heat you can still have the flavor just use like a bell pepper you know right <laughs> and so and then, i think the other thing is too because like some hot sauces it's just like it's just so hot you can't taste anything and peppers have flavor they have floral aromas they have they have flavor other than just like getting pounded with capsaicin. Sure. And and it's the fun thing is like it's it's in that pith. That's where the, the capsaicin hangs out. And so like even the super hot peppers, because I I enjoy heat, but I don't like to blow my head off. No. Um, I figured out that if you very carefully like nibbled onto the very bottom of the pepper, like even if it was a habanero or something and just didn't get any of that pith you could actually taste those notes and you're right even these so nice. peppers have amazing flavor and i am a, and I'm obsessed with a pepper called um oh shoot uh, i'm obsessed with the pepper that i just remember, forgot the name of oh detail pepper they're real famous in saint augustine florida and they're hot but they're like it's like fruity at the same time. And I know that you must have come across some of these type things when yeah, you're developing I think in that Scotch bonnet um, category pepper, I think. But yeah, yeah. I've, had, I've had them like once and they're delicious. So. Oh, it's just so nice. So now do you grow peppers up in Oregon? Y'all get a good pepper crop? We it's do. Hot. Yeah, it is hot actually. We're in Southern Oregon and um, okay. we grow amazing peppers. Uh, these these are from my neighbor's garden. I don't have a garden this year because we, we are spring fed. We're in huge drought and I yeah. just knew I wasn't going to have enough water to, to to garden. So it's kind of a, a hard year that way for me. Yeah. It's, and it's, such a, it's so satisfying, right? Like 
Oh, I, yeah. I can't hardly keep a house plant alive, but I love having a garden. It's I'm the just, same way. Like my poor house plants, they just suffer, but yeah, my garden is always happy. Yeah. Like I no. it's outside no. <laughs> no. Well, so tell people, let's talk about some of your classes. So what are some of the most popular classes uh, at, uh, with Ferment Works? Like what is the fermentation school? What, like, what are some of the classes that people are signing up for? Because I'd love for for folks that are watching now to go check your site out and to try to sign up for some classes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for example, the hot sauce class is pretty popular, especially yeah. this time of year. Um, and it's just a little class all on hot sauce and how to ferment it and how to flavor it afterwards. Um, this time of year too, uh, my Fermented vegetables, mastering fermented vegetables class. Mm. Oh my God, it's so good. Harvest either from their farmers, CSA boxes, market, garden. Um, yeah. And right now I'm actually, I thought it would be fun. So what I love to do is look at what's available and say, how would this make a recipe that's mm. tasty um, and really stick seasonally and not like pick ingredients that don't grow at the same time together, right? Um, and so I, I decided to take my Mastering Fermented Vegetable class, which is all just self-paced, pre-recorded, you know, it comes uh -huh. with you do your own thing. But I created four live Zoom sessions in the end of August, beginning of September, so that people could come, just chat with me, chat me up, bring their vegetables, and, like, we could make a plan. That's super cool. That's super cool. All right. We got a question from Scott. Scott's a great chef here in Atlanta. My pepper plants are blowing up and I'm out of pickle jars. What else can I do with this garden bounty? Freeze? I mean, what do you think? I don't know. Peppers, peppers could freeze, but they might get soft. They get a little soft. You can freeze. You can dehydrate. Um, but dehydrate. Them, they will be amazing. And you don't need a jar, or you can use a bigger jar, or you can use a crock. Um, that's what I do. Uh, I do. Say it I, again. I, I missed it. Say it again. What you, you do? Them, you ferment them. You can use a crock or a bigger jar or something else. You don't have to worry about it being a canning jar at all. Oh, yeah. Um, candy. I like to roast and freeze some peppers, you know? Yeah. Like, that's a good idea. Peel them and then freeze them that way a little packets. Nice, nice. Now I tried to make a hot sauce last year and I got some mold on it and I thought that my salt solution was high enough. So, so back, I know I can't tell you exactly what I did, but I, you know, I had some pepper and that peppers and I chopped them up seeds and all. I wanted it nice and hot, put it in a salty brine, put it in my jar like I always do and walked away and came back a week later and there was mold and I had to throw the whole thing out. I was super disappointed. So what are some what are some um, helpful hints for that? Let's let, let let's go through that. Yeah. First of all, so the um, you probably didn't do anything wrong, um, and so what the fermentation preserves by acidifying. Okay. Um, so salt is just in there partly for flavor, right? Because salt makes okay. things better. It's partly to make sure that the right microbes get on board because the lactobacillus doesn't mind salt, but some of the ones that we don't want do. And y'all, lactobacillus is what makes things happen, right? right? So if you've seen that and it's not milk, it's something completely different. But y'all, for those of you that don't know, we've got a good, we've got a couple of good pickle questions. So I'm sorry, please keep going, Kirsten. Right. It also hardens the cell walls and pectins. And so it's gonna, having some salt in your ferment is gonna keep that crisp. And, you know, for you all, when it's really hot in the summer and your house isn't cooling off at night, your ferment's getting a little warmer, that salt helps control it. Like, yeah, it, it heats up. So the ideal temperature for a ferment is 55 to 75. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're getting above that, it's going to speed up that fermentation. A little extra salt helps control it and keep it down. The other thing, so your little mold problem is just because mold is a fungus and it needs oxygen so what we're doing with fermentation is we're keeping everything under the oxygen so here's what i made the other day right it's just a sauerkraut and you can see that little brine's on there and i brought this up to 
show because see how that lid is taut. Like if you were a canner, like this yeah. is like a big old oh shit, this is this is bad news, right? Because that lid isn't sunk in, it's bulging. Um, but what that is, is that's the CO2. And we're gonna give it a little twist. And you see the bubbles. I don't know if you all uh -huh. see the bubbles. Yeah. With the and, light. Then, and then I'm gonna close that back up again. And now what I've done is I've let that oxygen that was in there out and it's only a little uh, blanket of CO2. And that CO2 is gonna keep that mold from growing. Wow, okay, so I can't see clearly. Do you have a glass weight on top or is it just the, the liquid? I, I do, there's a little glass weight on top. Um, it's not necessary, but it is, it's nice. It's just a nice yeah. little tool. And there's also a leaf. And like any ferment, you can put a leaf of some kind. This happens to be a cabbage leaf because it's a cabbage ferment, but like a grape leaf or, or yep. uh, you know, some kind of leaf that will, even a, you know, kale leaf, something that'll just hold everything under that brine and that keeps things like mold from wanting to. Very cool. Yeah, gosh, I was so you disappointed. Could, yeah, I bet you were. But here's the good news. You could scoop that mold off, actually, and it would have been fine. <laughs> you know, I have to laugh because I remember my grandparents, you know, when I was a kid, cheese is moldy. My grandmother would just like lob off the moldy cheese or country ham, moldy country ham. I just cut one the other day and I was laughing at myself brushing off the mold. You know, when I was a kid, I just thought it was Ew, gross. And now I'm like, I'm turned into my grandmother. Just so, yeah, I have done that. I, I, I know that um, you can do that. All right. So Jimmy Prophet is a great cook and friend and he, I pickle, but I've never fermented. What would be the first thing you should say I should try? Now, I have an idea, but I'm really curious about what you would say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would actually say something that you know you're going to want to eat. <laughs> Yay! That is so smart. So, yeah, I mean, if you love sauerkraut, sure, it's it's a no-brainer. You would try, with, try starting with sauerkraut. But if you don't think you love cabbage or sauerkraut, then, you know, do something – like a pepper ferment, like what we're going to do today, or um, carrots, like little carrots, carrots great. make a wonderful ferment. Um, but yeah, starting with with most vegetables is going to be super easy. So, and Jimmy is in Tennessee in the mountains, and and um, chow chow and things like that are really great on soup beans, Jimmy. I know you know that. So, um, you know, I do. I would say. A, Kraut, right? Because I just think it's so simple. And um, some of the things that I do, like I'll put like celery in it, you know what I mean? Like just some cloves of garlic and things like that. So it's, um, and it it's not, uh, if you taste this, if you taste what Kirsten is talking about or what I'm talking about in comparison to like the store-bought stuff, like the stuff that we make at home is so crunchy and vibrant and, you know, just alive. And I love that. So, hey, yeah, so I, you I make a fermented chow chow. So you can take that chow chow and go ahead and, and, and ferment it once you have Yeah, it. yeah. No, you know, I've wondered about that. Um, like we don't have, you know, uh, there's not a huge yeast bread tradition in the South. There's quick breads, right? There's biscuits and cornbread. And um, my whole entire life growing up, um, vinegar pickles. And I've often thought about that. I wonder sometimes if it's just been too hot. It's just too hot here. You know, it happened about 150 years ago with the industrialization of the food system. Right. Even, interestingly enough, even the quick breads and baking powder and, and all of that, there was a huge movement. So you know how people get wrapped around the axle and they're like determined they had decided that microbes in food must be a bad thing. And people, right. The guy that invented and really pushed baking soda was of a camp, a whole group of people that were like, mineral leavenings are much better than biological leavenings. Right. And right. It, it's funny. So they really tried to get that whole concept of using sourdough and yeast out of people's lives. And the other reason, which I read, which was crazy, is that 
quick breads, a woman who was working in a factory could make quicker and that way she could work in the factory longer. And so it's like, there's just so much wrapped up in Oh my gosh. Yeah. And vinegar is the same way. Like pour your vinegar over your food. It's going to go faster than waiting. Yeah. No. Did you read the book, The Baking Powder Wars? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, that sounds okay. interesting. Yeah. I'll send you the link for it. There's a book called The Baking Powder Wars because essentially, you know, like you just said, there was this huge movement to get microbes out of the kitchen. Microbes have been in the kitchen since... There was well, a kitchen, you know. We, I like to tell people we are here, like we're standing here, sitting here talking to you because our ancestors fermented food and had lots of microbes in their diet. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. Hey, so will you show us what you have for us to share today? Absolutely. So it's garden season, it's salsa season. We all have plenty of fresh tomatoes. Now, fermenting a green tomato is wonderful. Fermenting um, tomatillos are wonderful, but fermenting those red tomatoes is a little trickier. Like that wouldn't be my first ferment. And the reason is what we're working here is with is the lactic acid bacteria. Like Virginia said, that gives us cheese and yogurt and even the uh, sour and salami. It's great stuff. But um, when you've got a tomato, it's got all that sugar. Remember tomatoes are fruit. Right. Uh, what, is, what does fruit want to do? yeast wants to move in and help you out by making it into alcohol. And so you can, you can do a fermented tomato salsa and I do, but you have to kind of manage it and get it in that fridge quick or it gets really what I would call funky flavored. And that's those yeast flavors as they're mm -hmm. trying to turn it into alcohol and the lactobacillus is in there trying to acidify it. And it sometimes works out in a delicious way and sometimes it's a little more funky. So what I do is I make a salsa starter. Um, okay. And what I do is I just take all the ingredients that would be in salsa, right? So I've got my, my spicy peppers, I've got onions, I've got garlic, cilantro, little lemon juice. Uh-huh. So put in everything but the tomato. So I can start chopping and, and hopefully continue to talk. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep, yep. And um so I put all this in here and I make a fermented salsa starter. And I'll do this with my, you know, a lot of my garden vegetables because I'm now preserving these items um, in order to use later. And with the salsa starter, I have this then in my refrigerator and I can use this anytime I want to make something with either those flavors or a salsa. I'll just use my canned tomatoes, chop them up in this starter. Um, you know, it's a couple of tablespoons of this starter with those canned tomatoes, let it sit on the counter for a few hours mm -hmm. before I serve it. And now I've got a fermented salsa that tastes delicious and isn't um, funky in any way. I can do this with avocado. Now I've got like instant guacamole because this is all fermented. It's acidified. It's nice and salty. You throw that into the guacamole and voila, you're done. You've oh my gosh, I'm starving now. That sounds so <laughs> delicious. So you've got your vegetables and then how long do you let it ferment? Yeah, so this ferments on the counter for... Um, you know, this time of year, five to seven days. In, uh huh. Wow, this is a this is a spicy onion. Uh -huh. Um. Oh, and I want to tell everybody this is like a little aside, but I saw these sitting here. If you're doing hot peppers, like do do put on what these aren't very hot. But you know, five minutes after you're done, you forgot that you just did this. Put that in your eye, and you're wow. <laughs> you're miserable. Um, so on your counter, probably five to seven days Okay. Um, in, you know, ambient summer temperatures could be a little longer. What you're waiting for is for the vegetables to be acidified. Okay. And what that means is they will take or smell pickly. They will taste acidified. They'll taste pickly. Um, and they will, um, also lose their color. Wow. It's onion. Uh, you got a serious one. <laughs> it's a serious one. 
So this is about two days old. You can see it looks okay. sort of still, but see how those greens are turning kind of a dull-ish color? Right, right. Um, this, green, this green affair here will be completely olive drab, dull. You'll see the brine will look cloudy. These are all mm -hmm. clues to know that it's done. Okay. So officially to be safe, a ferment has to be 4.6 on the pH scale or below. Okay. So if you've ever canned salsa, right, you have to add a bunch of vinegar. You're yeah. getting full. And you can't really mess with those USDA recipes, right, because you need to keep it at that 4.6 or below. Right. The cool thing about fermentation is you can change that recipe all you want. You know, if I want to use these hot peppers versus this pepper, it doesn't matter because – the microbes are equal opportunity starch eaters, right? They're eating okay. the sugars and converting those into um, into acid, and so the whole thing will become four point six or below, and it actually is usually well below four point six. So it's very safe. Um, and does that have to do with any sort of proportions or? No, that's the cool thing. What? Are you serious? Oh my gosh. See, y'all, this is why I love this. And Cookbooks with Virginia is really just all about so I can entertain myself. And I'm glad that y'all come along for the ride. But I love this. Um, so here's okay. another little fun fact for those of you that can. Um, what I discovered is I loved, I love canning salsa. Uh -huh. But I hated that you had to add so much vinegar or lemon juice that when you can salsa was never, right. it, it's always running, right? Right. And so what I figured out once I really started fermenting and once I knew the rules, right, it has to be a low pH. Then I realized I could do this a week or two before I canned my tomato salsa and I didn't have to add all that acid because this – Fermentation brought the acid of these low acid vegetables into that range. I added my tomatoes, check my acid, and I'm well below 4.6. I know I'm safe and I can can that. And I had to, I didn't have to add any um, vinegar or lemon juice. All right, now let me ask you this. Do you do that in a boiling water canner? Uh-huh. Okay. So the, ferment, the fermentation part of this then is no longer mm – -hmm live however the um, science coming out now is pretty cool because now we're learning that even the little dead micro bodies are part of what our gut needs so ah. it's, it's great to eat them raw but if you don't always eat them raw it's actually just fine you're still getting the benefits you're getting the fact that the vitamin c has been elevated you're getting that more bioavailability so that part's pretty cool all right so we got some hardcore coming on in here scott's asking ph testers preference for brands or types i don't i don't know a brand when i i had i took at the usda class a couple years ago because for a client and did some preserving recipes and uh had to work with that or is there a company that you use um, you know, I've got this little one that I like and that I don't because it was fairly reasonably priced for home yeah. use. I don't know the name of it. Okay. Uh, and for home use too, like if you really aren't going to be doing this all the time, those little pH strips that you get at the brand supply store, they're not like 100% accurate, but you're, you'll are you get that you're well below 4.6. You'll be able to right. do the above. So for the home fermenter, that's sometimes um, easier than buying the you yeah. know, little tool. I think it's just been so fascinating. You know, like last year when the pandemic happened, I started doing more and picked up your books. And then, then you were a guest on the show once before. And I've loved it. And I've also been making um, kombucha this whole entire year. And that's been a really fun um, project. And learning about, like, the the... The, uh, the boundaries are sort of limitless. You know what I mean? Like if you want it more funky, just let it keep hanging out. It's true. Then, That's you know, what happens with the vegetables. If you test it or you check in on it in 
you know, three or, or excuse me, five to seven days and it isn't acidic yet, that's okay. Just wait. They're working slowly, but they're still working for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, so what I've done so far is I've put in about four cloves of garlic. I put in an onion. Um, I put in uh, those little peppers. Uh -huh. and the proportions don't matter because everything's going to acidify equally. What you do want is you want it to taste good while it's raw. So, right, if this tastes good when I make it, like the salt's good, the spice is good, it's just going to be better fermented. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to add a little cilantro here. Um, and you could absolutely do all this in a food processor, but the food processor never makes a nice demo because, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's true. Hey, y'all, I'm getting so absorbed in her recipe, but I want you to go, please go to my Instagram page, like Fury Ferments, um, and you can enter, follow me, follow uh, Kirsten, and then um, you can enter to win. All right, the the so amazing ginger pickles, beautiful photography, and really clear instructions, and um, and just oh yummy chocolate cranberry mole, spicy onion mango ferment. Oh, maybe I can do. Oh, it's dried mango. Um, I was telling um, Kirsten before we got on that I have a. Went to South Georgia to the Brown Farm Market and we got lots of peaches. So I want to try to figure out what to do with some peaches. Yeah, you know, that is an interesting thing. You said dried, and the reason is that um, you can put like dried tomatoes in here, and they're not going to cause all that yeasty problem. So dried. Right. Fruit, if you want a little bit of sweetness in your ferment, use dried fruit as a as a way to bring in that sweetness because any other thing that's sweet will actually just get fermented. Now I don't need this lemon for the fermentation to take place or okay. for the fermentation. I'm using this or I like to use limes too um, for the flavor. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting a lemon and some of its zest in here. And then I'm going to put in a teaspoon of salt and we talked a little bit already about the salt and why it's important um, it's gonna make that environment really nice for the fermentation the good microbes to do their thing it's gonna make it tastier keep that crisp for these onions okay um and so i'm just kind of massaging this around to get that salt starting to pull those um the juices out of the cell walls of these vegetables. And you notice it's a little chunky. That's uh -huh. what I mean, right? Because I want my chunky or my salsa or my pico de gallo later in the year to, to have some tooth, you know, to be Right, chunky. right, right. Some, some people, people could, you don't have to can this. People could ferment this for a couple of days and then and put some fresh tomato with it and have a really live culture fermented salsa that you could enjoy now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people get so scared of canning and I'm on a mission to, to keep people from thinking that, right? Oh, for sure. And you know, fermentation is so safe. So here's the cool thing, right? Um, if, for example, you lived in a place or there was E. coli on your vegetables, you okay. know, um, fermentation makes that acidity makes it so the E. coli cannot live. And so like, it's super safe. People are scared yeah. to death to kill somebody. It, 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 it's it's safe. Safe. So what I'm doing is I might have picked the I had two jars. I might have picked the wrong one. <laughs> I'm pressing that in here in order to get that brine to fill up in all those spaces. Now it might take, because these are chunky, uh -huh. it might take a half hour or more. So if you make this at home and you feel like it's not pressing in. It's okay, that salt's gonna still start working those um, juices out. Yeah. This is- I wanna make sure that it's covered. Right, and then all the little air spaces in, in between the vegetables are, so you can get your juice in there. I feel like the cilantro is just sticking all over me today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, 
Uh, I I you can see, but you can see that I'm pressing and those juices are fine. I've got plenty of juice here. Um, I don't know, like I said, but it is every time I press, it's bubbling up. Yeah, yeah. And so this is actually, I did pick the right size jar. This is actually ready to, um, to ferment. Now, you can, in order to set it up, you've got uh -huh. a couple of choices, but this is the easiest way. It's okay. kind of like I did with this one here, is I'm just going to put this lid on nice and tight. And I'm actually going to, because I don't have another little glass weight and okay. at home, I'm going to take it and I'm going to put this here. And it's going to keep everything down under the brine. Look how smart you are. And now I'm going to close that up, and I've got my weight, and that's just going to make it tastier, right? Oh, my gosh. It's going to taste and delicious. I already showed you guys what to do next, right? In a day or two, when this starts to, to bubble and you start to get that um, buildup of the CO2, you're going to give it a little twist and then close it right back up. You're going to do this for, like I said, about a week. See how vibrant that is? And yeah. Days, it's not going to be vibrant. It's going to be cloudy. It's going to be yep. the green is going to be dull. And then you're going to take or smell that kind of pickly funk and you're going to be in good shape. Now this wow. can go just like this in your refrigerator. What the refrigerator does is it puts those microbes to sleep. Doesn't kill anybody. Just slows down that fermentation. Um, puts them to sleep. And now this will, I have... Things like this that I've made three, four years ago that are still um, on the fridge. Yeah, I have four kids, and I still don't know how to can for just and ferment for just two people. So yeah, and like way too much stuff. So that's like oh, one more thing: the salt. Only roll it. I prefer natural mineralized salt, like sea salt or rock salts. But there's one rule: you can have. Um, iodine if your salt is naturally iodized, but not added iodine. Okay, that's that's good. So you, you do sea salt, like not like kosher salt. You do you mm -hmm. prefer to use sea salt? I use yeah, or this one that I'm using today is that Redmond Real Salt, which is a rock pink salt out of Utah. Um, in fact, cool. I've got a little permanent um, discount I'm allowed to give for there. They will give you I think ten or twenty percent, ten percent. Something off. Um, if you just go to their site and push in the word uh, or put the code ferment in. Oh, uh, cool. Well, is that somewhere on your website? I want people to make sure to check out your website. Y'all, she's got so many cool classes, and I'm actually signed up for two of them, and I haven't had a chance to take them yet <laughs> because my life is that way. But I want to. <laughs> And I want to, and one of them was like for the cloth, the African cloth, and so many cool things. Y'all, so make sure to go to Ferment Works and check it out. Go to my Instagram feed and look for this, this coffee. The, the, so many incredible recipes. Cooked tomato hot sauce, habanero hot sauce. Um, you've got like Asian recipes, African recipes. Uh, I mean, the recipes from all over the world. Well, you know, it was fun because the chili pepper is from the Americas, right? Wow. And until Columbus made his little mistake and bumped into the Americas and kind of changed everything, yep. the chili pepper was here, but that's how it, it marched across the world. You know, he brought that back to, right. to Europe and they didn't love it so much there because of the heat. But boy, in Asia, it just took off. And I had a lot of fun when we wrote this cookbook to look at the journey of the chili pepper and how it's been used. And like in Thailand, you know, that there's a recipe in there and it's for green pepper um, paste, green, green peppercorn paste, because right. that's what Asia had. They had green peppercorns, they had long pepper, they had um, ginger and different things, but they didn't have the chili yet. And so I had fun just kind of taking inspiration from this movement of the chili pepper. No, that's super cool. That's super cool. Well, I am so grateful to have you on as a guest. I want people to make sure that they check out the book. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so grateful. 
Yeah, thanks for inviting me again. Yay, fun. cool, awesome. Well, very good to talk to you and you have a, a great weekend and we're going to send people to your site, check out your classes and check out your cookbooks. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Yay, thank you again. Oh, y'all, isn't that fun? I could just talk to her for hours about this stuff. So please make sure you go to check out Theory Ferments on my Instagram uh, page and enter to win like a copy, share it. Um, it's all about celebrating people that write cookbooks. So, you know, um, I'm just, I'm just, I feel so blessed to know these folks and to get to meet them and cook from their cookbooks and learn. And this is, this is the woman you want. This is the woman that you want telling you what to do. So go check it out. Um, and there is another woman that you can check out too. So I've got some really great news. I'm going to start doing live cooking classes on Food Network Kitchen. So super excited. My first live class is going to be Tuesday the 10th at 4 p.m. Um, you can sign up for a seven-day trial, uh, seven-day free trial, um, but it's only $19.99 for the year. They don't come back and ask you for more money. Um, you can watch Food Network shows without ads. You can take my classes on demand. I have a whole series of um, canning, pickling, preserving, putting up jars and jams and jellies and all of that online right now. Um, I even got the Food Network lawyers, Kirsten, you'll get a kick out of this. I even got them to allow me a fermented um, recipe for pickled onions, um, which was sort of daring. You know, lawyers lawyers have pro lawyers don't know what they're doing sometimes. Anyway, it's just microbes. It's just good stuff for you. So anyway, thank you so much, y'all, for uh, joining me today. Have a great weekend. I've got lots of great guests uh, lined up. Nancy McDermott's coming down the pike. Uh, Dory Greenspan is coming down the pike. Um, lots and lots of great folks. So thank you so much. Bon appetit, y'all. Bye-bye now. <laughs>